All right, let us begin. Good morning. All right, so uh, we are going to continue discussing reduced MIPS type problems. Um, we are then going to go into pipelining. So at this point, everything we've been learning so far is counted. I have positive edge trigger, then there's neg negative edge trigger, which gives me I read the right capability of MIPS, and then the positive edge trigger is where my next instruction begins. So, but we've also been learning about these concepts of stages, right? So we have instruction pass, instruction decode, and execute, and we write that. So for the execution stage, we have four other portions of the data path that aren't being used, right? So the concept of pipelining is, how can I get more than one instruction into the data path at the same time? To improve performance, to speed everything up, so I'm also using as much of the data path as possible. We're going to be discussing how that's done, the benefits, and then we're also going to discuss the drawbacks of that. So first things first, we're going to watch the not responding Adobe Reader, not respond. It's fun. So here, we, so let's go here. We're on page, what, 13? And yeah, there we go. So I wanted to make sure that I, you guys could see this this time as we kind of went over. Uh, this is the last problem from uh, the previous assignment. But I just wanted to go over it again, kind of go over the step by step and why I chose it. We're going to do four other problems after this. And I want you guys, by the time we get to the fourth problem, you're going to be telling me which portions we're choosing, which portions we're not choosing. And I'm going to, at the end, show you what you should be doing when you're going to be studying for this type of problem on the exam. So this is just implements an R-type instruction only. So the whole point of this problem is to say, do you understand what the parts do? You know, I, if I wanted you to draw, we could be in art class, right? You should be able to explain to me what the program counter does, what the instruction member does, what the data memory does, what the registers do, what the ALU does what all of this memory addressing does with the shift left to, concatenation, adding, PC plus four. You should be able to explain all of this. This is an advanced digital system. We are now up to BLSI, so you've met yet another course objective, right? So, um, what's that? What does the IM stand for? Instruction memory. <laughs> it's okay. That's why, that's why we ask questions. Sometimes you're like, I, I think I know that. But I better ask to be sure, because it's better to be get, a, get a, everybody chuckle right now than minus 10 on the exam or whatever, right? You wouldn't lose 10 points for that, but just as an example, that's why I encourage questions. So first things first, program counter. Program counter tells me where we are in the instruction, right? PC plus 4, because of what? What's the two-word thing I'm looking for? By addressing. OK, good. I'm starting to go ahead and see. So now here's the thing. No branch equivalent or jump. Therefore, no further addressing. So if let's say I had on the type of, on the exam, I'll give you two instructions that you have to go through. So let's say I do R type and load word. Is there a branch in load word or R type? No. Is there a jump in branch? Is there a jump in load word or R type? Then you don't need to draw the rest of this. Right? If you draw the rest of this, you'll see a lot of X's on it, right? So don't be the type of person that's going, oh, I'm just going to memorize the whole data path and plop it on there. It's like people on exam two, I'm just going to memorize the previous code problem and hope I get a lot of points. Not going to work because you should be able to draw this reduced problem. So instruction memory, we need that for every possible reduced MIPS data path because you need the instruction, right? Comes out. You need to indicate it's 32 bits. See this little dash in 32? You're going to need to say that. You're also going to need to indicate that 31 to 26 goes to the controller. 25 to 21 is going to go to read reg 1. That's going to be the case for every single one. Because at some point, you need read reg 1 for every single instruction, except for jump. But then I will give you two on the exam. 
and you know, stamp and some other instruction, and every other instruction will require read read one. 20 to 16. Now here's the thing, it's an R type instruction, right? So we're taking two values, values from two registers, performing an operation in the ALU, and then putting it back in the third register, correct? Mm -hmm. So I need the two values from the registers, and they need to come out from the registers, right? Then I need to have the right register that I'm indicating. So in the R type instruction, if you recall, we had the 31 to 26 is the opcode, 25 to 21 is RS, 20 to 16 is RT, 15 to 11 is RD, right? And if you look at your MIP screen sheet, you'll see that for add instructions, you're adding them in the ALU and then storing it in the right register, correct? So the reason, if you recall, we had this register destination multiplexer. And the reason why is we had to choose between whether or not if we had an instance where we're going to write to a register. If it came from 20 to 16, maybe if it was an I type instruction or a load word, or 15 to 11 if it was an R type instruction. But since it's an R type instruction only, and I have a bad feeling this is not going to allow me to scroll. Correct. <laughs> we're just going to go to the Word document. You can still see that, right? All right. So. Since we, we're not making that decision, we don't need the multiplexer. <coughs> so drop the multiplexer, drop the control signal, reduces the size of your controller, right? Now, this 5 to 0 here, this 5 to 0 is going to the ALU control because that's our function. Also, we have the 2-bit ALU op comes in, and then we have a four-bit output. Recall from the uh, top of Google Objective 3.4, well, 3.14, where's the four-bit ALU that controls the 16 to 1 multiplexers for each of the 32-bit out outputs. In your ALU, it would be eight-bit outputs that you're doing your final project. That's controlled by the control signals from these four bits. Now, there's no data memory here. Why is there no data memory? Because it's our type, but why is it? That is, that is the technically correct answer, but what's the intuitive answer? <laughs> because it's R type, what, might, what about the fact that it's R type allows us to get rid of the data number here? We're only interested in the uh, registers. Correct. It's, we are performing, getting the information from the registers, doing something in the ALU, and then storing it to the registers. Correct? So in this case, just this reduced data path the problem specifically designed to see if you understand portions. Data memory isn't there because we're not accessing it in those type of instructions only. Does this make sense? How I've broken down and made these decisions? So with the 6.2, I believe, is load word instructions only. Yeah. Jump register. Jump register is an R type instruction, but uh, I'm. The whole idea about jump register is that you would be taking, and for exam, it's not necessary to do that because I'm limiting the, if you're adding branch equivalent, branch not equivalent, jump register, jump in length, it can become very uh, big. So I'm trying to narrow the scope to uh, minimize the complexity of the exam answer. But for what happens in a jump register, you, regist you are, if you look at the MIP screen sheet, you're just jumping to RS, right? So what's going to happen is you're going to control signal read from read register one, and then you're going to branch out from read data one, and then you so you already have a 32-bit value that's stored there. So it already accounts for byte addressing, and already accounts for the concatenation, because it'll store it from the jump and link instruction. So what's going to happen is it would just branch out here. I should, I should fan, say fan out because branch is an actual instruction type. And then you create another multiplexer, jump register, JR, which adds to your control unit, and then you would you would compare that to your program counter from the base jump addressing that you would calculate and the branch instruction that you calculate. So you would add yet another multiplexer there, and then it would go back to the program counter as before. So that's how jump register would work. But in this case, I, I, if, if I ask for an R type instruction, I will not expect you to do uh, all of the R type variants, just the ones that we covered just to uh, reduce the complexity of the exam answer.
Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, excellent. Any other questions about this? Okay, so I added a little note. Uh, if you can't read this, this is no data memory, no load word or store word. There, therefore, there's no memory to register and control signal and multiplexer. Uh, no register destination, no instruction with 20 to 16 is the right register. And no ALU source, no instruction where the immediate is the input to the ALU. <coughs> so these things kind of change when you have example 6.2 when we talk about in data bats that have load word only. So in this case, like always, PC plus four, no branch or load word, or, uh, no branch on load word, right? No jump. So we go right back. Read address, IM means instruction memory. The instruction comes out as 32 bits. 31 to 26 goes to your control unit. 25 to 21 goes to read register one. Now the load word instruction, what are we doing? We have RS, RT, and the immediate, right? What is the RT in the load word instruction? Destination, correct? So that's where we're writing to. So if the 2016 here goes to the right register. So there's nothing going to read reg 2 because we're not reading a second register, correct? All we're doing is what's physically going on, or if we have the load word, uh, where's my job? Maybe I can scroll up and uh, type it. So we have an example, load word uh, S0, uh, 16, S1, right? So here's what's physically going on in this type of instruction. What's physically going on is, uh, collapse the ribbon, there we go, good. What's physically going on in this instruction is S1 is read register one. It comes out of the ALU. 16 is stored in the 16-bit immediate value of the instruction. That comes from this 15 to 0, that sign extended to 32 bits, and then added in the ALU. That allows us to calculate the address that we're getting from data memory. This second value, S0 here, is when we're writing to. So what's going to happen is, you calculate the address, you get the value from data memory, and then you're going to write it back to this write data portion of the register, correct? 20 to 16, S0 in this example problem here, is telling me where to write. So what's going to happen is register write is going to become 1, and it's going to say what's the address, and then using your 5 to 32 decoder, which if you guys are happy, you won't have to do as much in the uh, design of your final data pad, you're just going to use if statements. But you use a 5 to 2, 32 decoder to give me the exact register I want. You would write the 32-bit value to that register. So that's what's physically going on when we have a load work instruction. So ALU is necessary. We need this 15-bit sign extension, the 32 bits to go to the ALU. We do not need the ALU source because we are not getting a second read data to out, right? So therefore, we don't need to make a decision. Therefore, the ALU source multiplexer is dropped. The ALU control, which <coughs> I get, if I, I can scroll down a little bit, receives a two-bit ALU op input. And if you recall from the previous class where we talked about the uh, control, um, the ALU control inputs, the function is a don't care. And the reason we don't care is because the function is only uh, available in R-type instructions. The R-type instructions have the last six bits, but in I-type instructions such as load word, those six bits are part of the six. I'll get to your question in a second. Adam. Those sixteen are part of the sixteen bit immediate. Does that make sense? So we don't have the function input to the ALU control here. Additionally, we don't have the five to zero going to the ALU. I probably should mention really fast that we did in fact have the ten to six going straight to the ALU for shift amount in the in this R type. I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but I'll mention it now that I'm thinking about it. So no input to read reg 2 since does not read from the register, so we don't need to read anything. 
Therefore, we also don't need ALU source since read data two never goes to the ALU. No memory to register because we, we'd only need memory to register if it was an R type where we'd have a value coming here and we need to compare. And memwrite is held at zero because we're never zero. However, we do need, you do need to include this because it's DRAM, right? So we need the values in order to indicate whether or not we're going to refresh. So on the exam, if you have to include the data memory, if it's load word, <coughs> hold memwrite at zero and memread is your toggled input. If it's store word, you're going to have memwrite and memread is equal to zero. Okay, Adam, what's your question? Um, so it's a 15 bit uh, going into the sign extend? A 15 to zero. Uh, so that thing makes it 16 bits. Yes. And so when it says 32 on the other side, it's 32 bits, so it'd be like 31 to zero. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because you're sign extending it by okay. 16 bits. I, I didn't know what you were saying. Yeah, that's correct. No, you're right. So the next problem is uh, store word. So instead of, uh, oh, hey, look. Instead of being all over the place, they're put in the convenient box today. Nice. So instead of going scrolling down here, let's actually do the data path. I am now Professor Robot, and you guys are going to tell me what you think should happen. Okay. So we, I want you to design a reduced MIPS data path that performs stored instructions only. What's the first step? PC plus four. Very good. So PC. New chalk, so that's going to, oh, that's right here. There we go. <laughs> so we'll put in the four, right? Plus. Now what? What do I do? Correct. Put me right to see out here again. So what do I do next? It goes into instruction memory, so this is the, what, this is the, yeah. yeah. D D E R, and what is this, Adam? What are we right here? Uh, the I M. Yeah, I M for instruction memory. You need to indicate what the parts <coughs> actually are, right? If you just leave these blank, if you just leave those blank. It's like, well, there could just be magical boxes. So what comes out here? Thirty-two bits. Exactly right. So what's the next thing I do? Uh, Thirty-one to twenty-six. Thirty-one to twenty-six. Very good. Those two control. Do we not have to write the, the instruction part out before? You can do that, yeah. I, it's STR. I, I consider that, you, you can do that. I consider it sufficient if you make that dash 32 okay. to demonstrate knowledge. Okay, so now we have our control. By the way, if you leave the control off, it's going to be a 20 point problem. If you leave the control off, minus 5. The reason why is because if you don't have a controller, your data path doesn't do anything. Okay? So if you're going to design an advanced digital system, it has to do things. Okay? So what's my next thing? What do I need to do next? 25, yeah. 25 to 21 goes to read write one. Now what do I do? This is where it gets tricky. Twenty sixteen goes to WR. No. <laughs> Hold on. Why? Why? Do, why do I express skepticism to that, Thomas? You read this from here, right? Correct. So where, where should it go instead? Correct. Exactly right. Yeah. Twenty sixteen goes to B reg two. Am I going to be writing anything here? With this instruction? No. Because we're going to take it from the registers to the data memory. So now, write register, write data, they're all alone. And then the little box here, registers. And then I hold uh, reg write equal to zero. So, correct, 15 to zero. And now what I do? Sign extend. And what do I need to indicate over here? 32. That's 32 bits. Exactly right. So now go to the 
Yep, exactly right, because that's the offset, so we're going to be adding it. <coughs> Got read data one and read data two. You guys were reading it from here. Yeah. So what are we doing with read data two? <coughs> exactly right, goes straight to the data memory. Why is that? Yeah, we're storing it. What it all, all, all I'm asking for is what is it? The 32 bits, exactly right. So what we're going to be doing is it's not going to the ALU. So do we need the ALU source MUX? No. So now we have our inputs to our ALU. ALU. We don't need to put a zero output because we don't have any branch. So why do we not need a uh, uh, read rage 2? No, we do need read rage 2. Oh, here. or the write register. Are right, we writing, right, yeah. or the, are uh, we writing or the, to the registers in a store word instruction? <laughs> I meant RD2, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. Yeah, well, why it's not that we don't. don't. It's I haven't drawn it yet. Oh, okay. But it's going to be going like, it's going off here to do something magical, which Aaron already described, but we'll go back over in a minute. Okay, so what is the output of the ALU doing? So I have my base address and my offset, right? So now I have my pointer, so what am I pointing to? Yep, you're pointing to the address. And so if I'm storing it, I'm taking something from the registers and putting it in data memory, right? So what am I taking from the registers? Where's that coming from, Thomas? There you go, now you're from read data to, right? And that is, so that's going to be, you call this write address, and that's data. And you can write DM for data memory here. And then you have... I'm going to abbreviate this to RNA because we're running out of chalkboard, right? But nothing comes from there, right? <laughs> so what am I? What do I have to write for the two control signals for data memory? Memory. Memory. Yeah. You put memory equals mom, and you have to put memory equals zero. <laughs> so what? I'm missing something. What am I missing? The output. You need the. Uh, ALU control. ALU control, right? Two bit ALU off. Two bit ALU Two bit. Four bit output. <laughs> Do I need anything else into the ALU control? No, why not? Because it's because it's I type. And what about what's the specific about I type allows us to not have, need anything else? It doesn't have a function. Does not have a function. And why don't we have anything coming out of data memory? Because we're storing it to data memory, we're not writing from data memory. Right. Very good. Correct, correct, correct. 2016, yep, 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 yep. You have a controller, sign extended is correct. No branch or jump, memory is one, memory, data memory. 20 out of 20. Good job. How do you know what like what the symbols are? Or the How do I know what the symbols are? Yeah, I mean like is it just something you learn for like what you mean the ALU, ALU symbols? Like ALU and the ad is the same symbol or Okay, so that, that's a good question. So this is just something uh, if in normal uh, schematics. You know, basically, the, AL, the, the base is the ALU. So you differentiate. You have it's kind of this, this shape here where you have you know, the two inputs, and this is what if you see something like this, you'll typically see it as an ALU input, right? Now that also applies to a controller, and if you, as we call from branch and jumping, you need zero outputs. If it's adders, you have to require uh, overflow detection and all that. The difference here, let me scroll up a little bit. It's the same symbol, but it just has a plus. That just indicates addition. So if you had a minus, what would it be? If you had a division symbol, what would it be? Okay. That, that one's a little too easy. <laughs> so you just use that symbol for any of the. Yeah, ALU. Mm -hmm. So if you have another, if we were doing a branch instruction, it would require the same symbol. I mean, you have the PC plus four coming in, and then you have the sign extended chip left two going in, and that's how you calculate your branch 
address. So as you can see here, just don't go for destruction zone. Okay. Pretty good. You guys got it exactly right. Good job. Yeah, I have a question. Why do the uh, load word and store word not need a shift amount? Why do they not need a shift amount? To go to the ALU. Because if you recall from if, like so, I see what you're asking. All right. If you recall from when we had to do the shift amount when it's stored in a register, the register is an actual number. So if we look at the load word zero, that's the actual number. We have to multiply that by four. When you actually have the number in the actual immediate instruction, the immediate addressing, this is a compiler-driven encoding of the micro engine. The compiler will already account for that. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So when you see an instruction, you'll never see this. You'll never see load word S0, uh, 5, S1. You'll never see that. It will already be multiplied by 4 to give you 20. That's why. That's a good question. Am I getting shocked all over your bag? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to do example 6.4. We're doing load word and store word. So let's walk through this data path. This is where you have to start making some more decisions, right? Program counter, PC plus four, immediate, show me the instruction memory, read address and instruction, 32 bit output, 31 and 26 controller, 25 to 21 goes to read reg one. And so that's where everything is the same, right? This is where things you have to start making design decisions. Now, ignore the fact that I've already, you already have the answer. I'm going to ask you, do we need, when I say do we need, it's not just a yes or no question. I want you to justify your answer. Do we need an input into read register two? Why? I know the answer's up there, but ask why. This is your engineers, you're naturally in front of the challenge. Why, why, don't just believe the professor. Challenge, why is that there? Exactly, because you need the read register two to comment for, for store word instructions, right? Very good. Do we need an input to the right register? Yes. Why? Because we're going to we, we need to determine whether red joint is going to be zero or one to write for for load word instructions. Therefore, I also need input to write data. Correct. Mm -hmm. Do I need the immediate value? Yes. Why? Because they're both type have instructions. Correct. So I have to sign extend it to 32 bits. Correct. Mm -hmm. So now I have read data one. Read data one is always going to go to the ALU. Where does read data two go? Someone besides Aaron Farnham. Data memory. Data memory. Why? Because you're storing the instruction. Yeah. Storing the instruction. <laughs> storing the actual value. This is the actual value, right? So think about the analogy I've been using for going to a house. RD1 tells me which street you're on. The offset tells me what house. You get to the house, I bring the, the dish for dinner, right? Or dessert. This is what I'm actually bringing, the actual physical value. So therefore, we have to calculate the offset for both load word and store word, right? I need mem read and mem write. Now, notice I haven't had equals zero or equals one here. Why is that? They both equal one. They both equal one when? Oh, when the other one does it. Correct. <laughs> Remember Q never ever equals Q not, mem read, yeah. and mem write never, never equals yes. Nothing ever equals Q not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Senior Chief Bennett. Um, <laughs> so they can both equal zero, but in the instance of R type instructions, but if it was R type instruction only, it would go away magically. Mm -hmm. Mem read is one when. What type of instruction? <laughs> Load it, correct. Because I'm loading it through the register. If mem write is one, what does that mean? Store word. Follows logically. Okay. If ALU control, 40 bit output, 2 bit ALU off, live. Do I need a function? No, because it's a medium. And it doesn't have a function. Correct. 
Do I did I forget to include a little four dash there? Good. Minus zero point five on the professor. So why did the ALU in any situation not need the zero uh, coming out of it? Because we don't have branch instructions. The zero in this case, the zero flag. Again, this is uh, to kind of follow up on the point that uh, a question that uh, Lee asked earlier. Um, the, if we were to keep adding more and more to the data path to account for all of the green sheet, eventually it would just become an impossible problem to get an hour and a half or two hours because, oh, I got to add jumping link, so now I have to add another multiplexer here to account for the eight bit input and go into there and then store it, store that into the bit 31. You know, it gets very complicated. In this case, for just the reduced, you know, to make it fair on an exam, zero bit output is going to be required to determine branch equivalent or branch not equal only. Does that, does that make sense? Does that, that's, that's an interest of making the exam fair. Uh, did I include anything else? Okay. So I, Professor, at 19.5 out of 20, need to include. Four bit ALU output, which I did do there correctly. Okay, so now for this problem, it's R type and add immediate instructions. So again, no branch or jump here. <coughs> you can Instruction memory, PC, PC plus 4, read address, 32-bit instruction on the output, 3126 goes to the controller, 25 or 21 goes to read register 1. Do I need input for read register 2? Why? Why or why not? You type of instructions uh, are right to R type, it looks at like two registers. Correct. Is that right? So I need both read registers coming out, okay? Do I need 20 to 16 coming in as a potential write? Why? And I mean it, exactly right, because we're going to be writing to the 20 to 16, because it's RS, RT. So we have 15 to 11 here coming in to 1 and going into write register, right? Because that's for our type of structure. 15 to 11. 15, 15 to 11, because it's... The, the R type instruction, <coughs> oftentimes I'll see students on exams, uh, they'll have the instruction types written out. In your case, you'll be provided with the MIP screen sheet, so it's in the bottom right of the MIP screen sheet. Remember for R type instructions, 31 to 26 is the op code. For R, 25 to 21 is RS, 20 to 16 is RT, 15 to 11 is RD. Yeah. 20 to 15, so if there's an add instruction, it would be 25 to 21 plus 20 to 16 equals Sorted 15 to 11. Question. Answer. Because it's also an, uh, the add immediate, we also have the 15 bits or 16 bits coming down. Bingo. So is that why the multiplexer is there? To determine where the. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, so the register destination is when you have to make a choice between which right register you're going to want to use. So in this case, if it's an R type instruction, we need to write to the register indicated by 15 to 11, right? That's 5 bits, 2 to the 5 is 32. If it's an I type instruction, we need 2016 because that's the RT value. So <coughs> if you have to make a decision, that's when you use the multiplexer. So if you remember off at the top of that objective, it's zero if it's an I type or one if it's an R type. Register destination is going to indicate multiplexer. But you are correct. We have 15 to zero come down here because we need it sign extended in order to add it in the case of an add immediate, right? I assume since it's an R type instruction, 10 to 6 is sent to the ALU to provide shift ref and shift right logical. We sign extend it, the immediate value with 32 bits, and that becomes one of the inputs to our ALU source multiplexer. We have to make a decision here why. Because you're really taking. So one side there, sorry. Yeah. No, no shame, you know it, but I just want. I, well, I want other students to try. Even if even if you if you're sitting there right now and you're going, I have no idea. I want you to take a shot. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to be wrong. 
What's that, Thomas? Lesser Dick Cheney. Lesser Dick Cheney. That shows well. Right, anyway, so politics aside, politics were on Tuesday, today's Thursday. Um, and Dick Cheney wasn't even up for election anyway. Um, alien source, read it. Okay. Aside from Dick, that random Dick Cheney politics, why do I choose between the alien source and as you input the alien, you might be you. registered, so they might be registered in the media. Thank you, thank you, Lee. Don't write Dick Cheney on the exam. <laughs> Zero. Yeah, like gross conceptual error. Okay, so I need I need it, this multiplexer to decide, right? Alien source because it's the source for the Second ALU input, right? Hence ALU source. Wait, so it's deciding between add immediate and register? Correct. Like, again, just like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Okay. This one decides between <coughs> two, it's a, this one's a 10 to 5 mux because you have two 5 bit inputs. You have 20 to 16 and 50 to 11, right. which are then, when you go in here, you have a 5 to 32 decoder, which then uses to select the specific 32 bit registers you want. So if I uh, if we had actually done the physical <coughs> implementation I was planning on at the beginning of the semester, you're taking your five to thirty-two bit decoder, taking that one selected line, and then selected all the all these specific SRAMs. From there, you would take the register right, and if it's zero, you don't do anything. That's why we have that's why we're allowed to don't cares on store word instructions and branch instructions, because it doesn't matter if the reg right's gonna hold it at zero. So you can, I can say whatever house you want to get to, but if the door's locked and I'm not letting you in and the police are outside, you're not getting in the house, right? So that's what the register right control signal is doing. Here, you have two 32-bit outputs going to the ALU. Additionally, you have a 32-bit immediate value. If it's an I type, if it's this add immediate instruction, you'd be adding the value in register one. So if it was I++, plus plus, right? right, from your exam or from the extra credit, the value of i is stored in RD1. Plus plus indicates plus one, right? So this sign extended value would be one. So 32 bit, this is 31 zeros and one. ALU source would say, well, I want this value. So that's sent to the ALU. <coughs> and then the right register would also be i. So let's say i was in S0. S0 would be here. S0 would be 20 to 16. Register destination would be zero, and indicates right register. We would produce the result from the ALU, and then we'd go to write data. Does that make sense? Why, why does it go to write data? Write data because I'm actually taking the physical value from the ALU and putting it back into a register. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I also yeah, have sure. a question about the thing you wrote on the board with the load word. Um, so when you write the 20 and then in parentheses like S1 beside it, that mm -hmm. means it's S1 multiplied by something to get 20? Okay, so here, so read data 1 is where S1 is going to come from, right? So that's going to go to the ALU. The 20 is the offset. So what you're, you're doing is actually calculating the location of memory. So going back to the idea of pointers you were talking about. The, actual base address, the compiler will load the base address into a register in this specific problem as S1. S1 in this problem correlates to the value stored in 25 to 21 here. So if we can look at our MIP screen sheet, we would have the opcode. 25 to 21 would be S0, which is 10000. That comes down on the output. 20 is also considered by the compiler. So they have base addressing. It's actually 20 divided by 4 is 5, right? So that would be, if we said val, vals array, right? It would be vals 5. If it was vals 4, this would be 16. If it was vals 3, it would be 12. If it was vals 0, it would be 0. So it saves you from having to do the add immediate before that? Bingo. Exactly. An advantage of compiler driven encoding on the back door. So what's going to happen is it comes into the ALU, the sign extended value is calculated in the ALU, they're added and now it points to the address, right? If mem, in this case memory is going to be one, or it's a load word, and then you're going to have the feedback here go back to the register. 
in this particular circuit, we drew a store word instruction, which means we take the value from RD1, it's going to look like this, S1, right? If this were store word instead of load word, right? What we would be doing is we'd be adding in the ALU, determining the address, and then this register as the S, the other S0, sorry, this S0 and that's S1, is coming from read data 2. That's the physical value we want to store to memory. And it's going to come from the registers and go to the data memory. So it's going to circumvent the ALU. And we don't need this ALU source because in this case where it's only stored only, we do not want to have a value. We don't, we're not going to make a decision here. You only need to include multiplexers when you're making a decision. And those input signals allow you to choose. For example, here, register destination. In the, in the, for those of you watching on the video later, R type and add I problem on the, on the screen. We have to make a decision here between 20 to 16 to 15 to 11 because 15 to 11 is the address of the register we're writing to for R type instructions. And 20 to 16 is the address we're writing to for add I. Also in ALU source, we are making a decision here between the value for add I on the sign extended for one, if it's zero, we are choosing the second register because it's the R type instruction. Does that make sense? And the multiplexer ignores the 10 down to zero? The no, what do you mean, the 10 down to zero? For the 15 down to zero, it's taking the 15 to 11, yeah. the 15 to zero. Oh, 15, yeah, because you're, if you remember what we call from doing the BHDL assignment, it's only going to have the two 5-bit inputs and one 5-bit output. In that case, the 15 down to zero is just fanned out here. <coughs> so you said this is a single cycle data path, what does that mean? Very good question. It's as if you know what we're going to go to next in the lecture. <laughs> uh, <I'm sorry. laughs> so there's there's three types. Um, there's single cycle, multi cycle, and pipelining. We're not going to cover multi cycle in this course. But the idea is one of the benefits is so we we determined that in R type instructions we don't need data memory, right? So if multi cycle means that every stage is broken down into a cycle. And then the length of the instruction just only uses the portions of the data path needed to do that. Um, it can be a very, the, um, the controller becomes much more complicated because now you're using a finite state machine. Um, I gladly post the, uh, the a, a PDF of the multi-cycle data path in FSM if you like. Um, we won't be covering it on the exam or in detail in this course. But the next portion is going to be called pipelining. <coughs> where we're going to have buffers in between instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, memory, and write back. So that way we can, the instruction can go to send it out, next cycle, send it out, so you can speed up the clock and have up to five instructions of the data path at any given moment. So that, that's the difference. Any other questions? About single cycle? Why is there, what's five down to zero? Really? Five down to zero is the function. <laughs> yeah, for our type. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, okay. I have a question. That's okay. Just giving you good nature grief. Okay, so on your exam, the way you practice, is that would take R type, add, load word, store word, branch, jump. <coughs> okay. So when you're practicing, what I would do is I would pick any two. Like we did like we did earlier, we did load word and store word, right? Here we did R type and add I. You do R type and load word. Load word and jump. Branch and add I. And then go through and design the data path. Do I actually need this? Why do I need it? Why don't I need it? Because that's what you're going to be doing when you graduate. Eventually, whether you're going to be coding or whether you're going to be doing physical implementation, do I actually need this code here? Do I actually need this function? Do I actually need this element in memory? Remember, going back to the design principle, smaller is faster. So going 
going back to Amdahl's law, can I reduce this portion of the data path to help reduce the overall performance by a certain amount? So this is a good combining concepts type question that goes into everything that we've learned so far in the course. Which is why you'll get questions like this, uh, especially at places like Intel, um, AMD. They'll, they'll give you a set of textbooks that you're going to want to read. And they'll say, so let's say they say patterson Hennessy because that's a common textbook, right? They'll say, study patterson Hennessy. All right, we, you study patterson Hennessy in advanced systems. All right, they'll go up there and go, all right, give me a reduced MIPS data path that does add, <coughs> and, uh, add in uh, branch instructions. Go. They'll put you on a portal whiteboard. There's five or six people there. Guess what? You're going to crush that question. Potentially. Potentially. Another question we'll go over this later is some they said you know the you know the single cycle data path they don't present the uh, pipe the full pipeline data path in the textbook they ask them to design it on the board so guess what you guys will get to do on an exam <laughs> 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 I want to settle in life. Yes. Um, all right. So to answer these questions, pipelining. What is pipelining? Pipelining. Divide the data path into nearly equal tasks to be formed serially and requiring non-overlapping resources. So this is where the write and read capability of the registers becomes important. Because you need to write first and then read so that you're not overlapping. <laughs> On a case where you have a load, the last instruction, you're either writing back from the adder or from the load word, but then you need that same instruction to be taken from the instruction decode and put to the ALU. Insert registers of task boundaries in the data path. Registers pass the output data from one task as input data to the next task. And that's controlled using a clock signal. So there's the clock signal, and then you have the and when we show, I show you the data path, you have instruction fetch, instruction decode buffer, instruction decode execute buffer, execution data path, data memory buffer, data memory write back buffer. So you have four of uh, these registered buffers block uh, di di uh, differentiating between each portion of the data path. <clears throat> Synchronized task with the clock having a cycle time that just exceeds the time required by the longest task. So if instruction fetch took one nanosecond, instruction decode took two nanoseconds. ALU took two nanoseconds. Data memory takes three nanoseconds. Write back takes one nanosecond. What that means is we have the clock set at the longest half. So it's going to become three nanoseconds. And then the buffer will just hold it for the other two nanoseconds. Or in the case of instruction instruction fetch where it's one nanosecond, you'd have it hold for two nanoseconds. So just like in the timing that you did, that you're doing in BHDL, you're going to be, when you insert that, after five nanoseconds, you're doing the exact same thing that's being done in Python. So for those of you who have actually taken a look at the final project, I actually have the, I have the data path drawn out, but I also have portions where you're going to insert buffers. And then the first portion of your final project is you're actually going to calculate the length that you need to delay everything. And you're going to do that by, and I actually say, you need to delay this with this part, this part plus this part. So you've actually delayed all the parts, and now you're just putting them together for the final project. And I was talking to somebody about this yesterday, about the final project being worth a significant portion of the uh, VHDL final grade. It's worth half of it, but you'll have done most of the work so far this semester. Um, by putting the pieces together and fixing the portions that you've done, you'll have a significantly higher final project grade. But your, I, I so by uh, this will help bring your grades up, and I call this a reward for willingness to be challenged. I understand that the VHDL projects have been challenging, but you'll be rewarded for sticking through it through the course of the semester with the final project. Does that make sense? So, and then last thing, uh, break each instruction down into a fixed number of tasks so that the instructions can be executed in a staggered fashion, so that MIPS. We have five, we have instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute, memory, and write back. Um, there's a concept called super pipelining where you break it into the smallest number of stages possible. But uh, we, may, we may or may not get into that at the, uh, towards the end of the course, depending on time. Okay, 
So here's an example. I'm going to scroll down to about so you guys can see this portion. Um, in single cycle data path, the longest instruction is going to be a load word instruction. If we break down all the difference, we do R type instructions, uh, store word instructions, R format. We don't have a write back stage in store word, right? Because we're not writing anything back to the registers. In R type instructions, we're not doing, we don't have a data memory or write back stage. Or so we don't have a data memory stage because we're not accessing data memory, we just go straight to the write back stage. And branch, I copy the LU, I do it in the adder, it goes straight back. So I don't have a data memory or a write back stage. Right? So we see these different types based on these per, per, uh, selected performance metrics, eight nanoseconds, seven nanoseconds, six nanoseconds, five nanoseconds. So what the single cycle clock cycle is calculating is eight nanoseconds would be the cycle time for the instruction before we do the next instruction. So that way you can calculate every possible instruction. But based on this, if we're doing pipelining, we don't calculate the longest possible instruction. We calculate the longest possible task, which is our stages. So if we look through here, we see that the longest possible one here is actually two nanoseconds. So the clock cycle is going to go from eight nanoseconds down to two nanoseconds. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put the instructions in in a staggered fashion. And so here is how it would work in single cycle. You have eight nanoseconds, eight nanoseconds, eight nanoseconds. So if you're performing three instructions, in this case, we just have three load word instructions. We would have a total of eight nanoseconds, eight nanoseconds, and eight nanoseconds, so it becomes 24 nanoseconds. In pipelining, the moment that the instruction fetch is done and it's moved its data over to instruction decode, we're going to fetch the next instruction. So what's going to happen is each stage is going to be limited to two nanoseconds. So then the the length of that instruction is going to become each the length of each instruction is going to become ten. So the length of the instructions themselves is going to be longer than the eight nanoseconds because you recall. There, there are two stages that only required one nanosecond for single cycle, right? However, be, but because of the fact that we have multiple instructions in the data path at the same time, which is enabled by putting these registers between each stage and making sure they don't, don't have overlapping paths, we can actually, I can actually get an instruction fetch. Increment the program counter. Get the next instruction. Increment the program counter. Get the next instruction. And put them into the data path and improve performance. And in this case, 10, 12, 14, takes 14 nanoseconds. So our improvement in performance is 24 over 14. Does multi-cycle do them at the same time? Multi-cycle does not do them at the same time. What multi-cycle does is, uh, we've got a nice <coughs> broken job. Multi-cycle just does only what's required. So if I had a, a uh, if I had an add instruction, so I had a sorry, load word instruction, an add instruction, and a store instruction, right? Load word right. takes the entire eight nanoseconds, right? Because it requires all eight. But then it starts here. For recall, here, R type requires six nanoseconds, right? So the finite state machine would skip over the data memory stage entirely. So this would just take six nanoseconds. So this would be A. Six and then store word also requires seven nanoseconds. So this would go to seven. In single cycle, this would be eight, eight, and eight. So this would be 24 over 21 would be our improvement in performance. So one of the reasons why you don't see uh, uh, multi-cycle terribly much is because you don't really get, you gain a lot of hardware overhead and not a lot of improvement in performance, which is why in this course I've elected to skip over it and go straight to pipeline. Okay, so here's an example question that gives like a theoretical description of this improvement in performance. You can bet your life that you'll see this again. Assuming n computations, so n is the number of instructions, 
k stages for an ideal simple linear pipeline. So what would what what be the value of k in this? <laughs> the number of stages in the pipeline. What's the, what's the value of k in the MEPS data path that we've covered? Instruction fetch, instruction decode, execute memory, write back. What's the number of k? Five, right? Very good. Now, TSC is time with single cycle. So in the example, that single cycle time would be eight, right? And T pipeline, TP here, TP like on the table over there, would have been two. Does that make sense? Derive the equation for speed up compared to a nonlinear pipeline in its throughput. So nonlinear pipeline is single cycle. Where the clock cycle for the single cycle is TSC and pipeline is TP. So if we recall our throughput calculations from back in section one, we have N, K, and T, right? Now, here I have N times T of single cycle. Now, why do you think that is? Why don't you think I have N times K times TSC, which is a common example statement? Why is it K there for a single cycle? Because it's one, right? Because all of the work is done in one cycle. In the throughput, now we have, now we're going to calculate uh, this actual value. So what I have is K plus N minus one times the pipeline time. Let's prove that is true. So how many cycles does the first, will the first instruction take? If each instruction takes k cycles, this requires k stages, therefore it requires k cycles, right? So MIPS, that's five, right? So you're going to have fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back, right? So that's k. So then, recall, now we're putting it in, the next instruction is going to be fetch, decode, execute, memory, write back. So now n is 1, n is 2, right? So that's 5. We've now, but we've only added one more cycle, right? So now this becomes 6. So here's going to be, well, let's make a note, k equals 5. If I add a third instruction in an ideal, it's going to fetch, decode, execute, memory, right back. We're only adding one cycle, right? See how we're only adding one cycle? So that's where the, uh, well, that's where the one is going to come from. That's 7. Do one more. This will be sufficient for the proof. Execute, memory, write back. So this will be 8. So if we have four computations, this means n is 4, right? k is 5, right? So what is 5 plus 4? That's simple, but bear with me. 9, right? But how many cycles did we actually take? Eight. Eight. Exactly right. So what's nine minus eight? That's where the one comes from. Now, if we start with n equals one, right? That's our first instruction, correct? What's k? What's five plus one? How many instructions did it actually take? Six minus five? One. So the way we figure it out is so this is actually n plus k minus 1, and now we're adding 1 to k, right, for each instruction. I'm sorry, adding 1 to n for each instruction. So the reason this works is because I've added one instruction for the, for the instance where we have one instruction. I add 1, I have the number of stages, but I have to account for that first one because the number of stages of just one instruction is just going to be the number of stages, right? So now I have a second one, I've added one, I have a third one, I've added two, a fourth one, I've added three. So therefore, k minus, uh, n minus one 
is the number of stages we're adding, and k is the initial number of stages. So that's why we can say it's k plus n minus 1 times the pipeline cycle time. So now we get to speed up. Speed up is execution time old over execution time new. Single cycle over pipelines becomes n times cycle time of a uh, single cycle. And the pipeline is k plus n minus 1 times the pipeline cycle. So the last portion of the problem is as the number of instructions gets significantly larger than k. So if we have an, a program that runs a million instructions, or two million instructions, or three million instructions. The difference between one million and one million and four is just going to be two million, two million and four, three million, three million and four for a five stage pipe, right? So this is going to get closer and closer to n, right? This n over k plus n minus one. Recall from limits from calculus one, those can those cancel out, right? So as k gets much, much larger, I mean, n gets much, much larger as k, it's going to, the n and k plus n are going to cancel out. So then it becomes the cycle time of single cycle divided by the cycle time of a pipe. So that is, let me erase this really quick on the board, TSC over TP, TSC over T and P. So for the, for the ideal case, what is, how do these compare? How many stages does the cycle time take? One cycle, but how many stages does it still have? It still has five. But in this case, when I say it's an ideal simple pipeline of K for stages, what's the value going to be? K. Now for single cycle, remember each stage is broken down. So in an ideal case, what do you think that site, that time is going to be? You're going to have something times k equals the, the full cycle time. So what do I have to calculate? Recall back a little earlier when we were talking about the stages for a single cycle, and we had add at the load the instruction, batch instruction decode. So in this case, in an ideal case, it would just be equal to TP, right? Because I'm taking TP plus TP plus TP plus TP, adding them together k times. So now it's just k times TP divided by the pipeline time. And these cancel out. And so as we get significantly larger number of instructions, <coughs> it becomes k. And the whole point of this problem is to demonstrate that you know by getting down to this k, the, the point of pipelining, to get back to your question earlier, is to try to get an ideal situation where we can have k instructions in the data path at the same time to improve, to get a speed up of k. Make sense? I think my second time I taught this course, there are a couple of people who are so skeptical of this problem, I literally spent a whole lecture doing nothing but that proof of the k plus n minus 1. Yeah. yeah, I believe I button. Believe you. Uh, you shouldn't press that I believe button. I just went through the whole proof. Okay, so. Is that part of the example? Which one? Is that part of the example? What? That graph. No, this graph is not. This is just explanation. <laughs> okay, so you have kind of the, this graph before where the instruction, fetch, instruction, decode, execute, memory, and write back are broken down, right? The single cycle. In the pipeline version, you're adding these buffers. So everything that comes before is added to the buffer. And so you have a certain amount of time. So if this is one nanosecond, this is two nanoseconds, this buffer is going to hold it for one nanosecond, right? And then everything that's calculated from the previous stage is going to move to the next stage. And then PC plus four is going to be able to add in another instruction. Then everything is calculated here. The figure from the book does not include the control signal, minus five. Um, registers, everything's put here, the sign extension, every, you know, it's put there and it's held. Execution stage, everything's calculated, it's held. 
data memory from the memory write back stage, and the MUX then writes back to here. Now, this is why we require write and read capability of the registers. You're going to need to write to update to get the most recent copy of the register, and then I can access it and put it down to the buffer. So, describing what I just described, instruction fetch, the blue indicates what we're doing. Instruction decode, getting everything from the buffer, and then this means the split is right, and then putting everything from the registers onto the buffer. For the execution stage, you take everything from the buffer, calculate it, put it on the execution stage. For the memory stage of the data path, it's a little fuzzy, but you get the idea. Put there, in the case of a store word instruction, I'm sorry, load word instruction, we read from memory, and then here, and then the write back stage, we write back, and this half of the register indicates we're writing to the register first. So in this case, we would write and then read. So uh, we will, I, I don't think, yeah, let's, we'll do this and then we'll, uh, we'll describe this and then we'll close here. The homework assignment will be example 6.2 through 6.6 .6, and the topical guide objective that's covered just yeah, just six seventeen. Um, so the pipeline is basically splitting it up. Yes. Yeah. This 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 uh, may explaining this graph will actually answer your question. So first instruction is a loan word instruction. Take things from the instruction memory. Clock cycle one is done, right? Clock cycle two, I am performing a value, the register, getting the values from the register and putting them into this buffer. But in the next cycle, I'm doing a subtraction instruction where I'm getting things from the instruction number. Third clock cycle comes by. We're putting stuff to the ALU. Subtraction is taking stuff from the instruction memory and putting and getting that value from the registers. We have an add instruction that's now getting instruction memory, PC plus four, PC plus four, PC plus four. And putting in here. Fourth, fourth cycle, I'm getting stuff from the data memory. It's a load word. Okay, putting it on a buffer. ALU is I'm taking things from the register into the uh, ALU here, putting it on the buffer. Add is now getting stuff from the registers and putting it on the buffer. Load word is getting things from instruction memory. Cycle five, we have all five instructions. This is where the ideal comes in. We had a million instructions and we didn't have any issues, we have this over and over again, right? Cycle six, we've already completed the instruction. We complete sub subtraction now by doing the write back. Data memory, we're add. We're now calculating the address for this load word instruction. And the add, we're getting stuff from the register, the ALU. And you see cycle seven, registers, data memory, ALU here, because we're now calculating this add instruction at the bottom. We're now doing write back for load word in cycle eight. So right back to uh, register 13 and data memory here for the add instruction, which we're circumventing, which is why it's white. And then blue here for the last cycle, cycle nine. So I want to leave you with a question I want you to think about for next class. What problems could arise? <clears throat> Sounds all well and good, right? So far, everything's faster. Let's let you guys out. What do you think? Any ideas on what the problem could be? What's that? What happens when you have to branch, right? Yeah, that becomes a real problem. So it's basically the same as pipelining in a computer program? Yeah. Exactly right. Okay, so if nobody has any other questions, you're dismissed.